Last portion on the executive branch is going to be the election of the president. Uh, that's going to be through the process of the Electoral College, which we already detailed earlier when we talked about um, the, the Constitution, uh, as well as the debates uh, between the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists. But a really, really quick uh, reminder, uh, that's through the Electoral College system, and that is not a popular election, uh, or even an election carried out by the Senate uh, or the state legislatures or the House of Representatives. That one's a, kind of a weird, unique uh, format where we have the Electoral College. I remember in an effort to have, well, keep, keep in mind they made this system in the 18th century when it was difficult for people to find out about all the candidates, be aware of them. It wasn't necessarily that they thought people were too stupid, although some of them did. Uh, but it was more so about the logistics uh, and not having the information and it being difficult to gather and count all of those votes uh, for a popular election. So they uh, instead de developed a, uh, a, a system of electors where states draw these districts and the uh, majority winners uh, of that district uh, get that electors vote. That, that elector goes and represents uh, that district for that vote and then the states uh, generally speaking, with the exception of a couple nowadays, vote in total blocks. So the state, uh, or sorry, the uh, candidate that has the most electors, the majority uh, of the electors uh, in a state to get all of the electoral votes, even if you know they only had 51% uh, of the electors in that state or, or more, they still get all of the votes. And then you tally those up and the uh, majority winner gets the presidency. Uh, so that's the electoral college, just like I said, the kind of that reminder. Uh, so it's going to be, be a, uh, a state district uh, set of electors who vote in district and then state blocks, meaning whoever gets the majority gets all the votes in that district and then in that state out of all the districts inside of it, whoever has a majority gets all of the um, uh, uh, votes, uh, all the electoral votes for this. The only exceptional states uh, regarding that those voting blocks are Maine and Nebraska, who have a, uh, uh, a combined congressional district and uh, population uh, district, and they don't vote necessarily in blocks uh, in those two states. But the other ones all do, so far as I know. Um, Regardless, that's how the uh, electors are uh, chosen by district inside the state legislature decides how they do that. Uh, and then you win uh, district by majority in the state uh, by uh, elector majority. And um, the total amount that you're going to see is basically the House of Representatives plus the uh, Senate uh, seats. So it's gonna be 435 plus 100, so that would be 535. But recently, they have added in the 23rd, no, 25th Amendment? 23rd or 25th? I think it was the 25th. Maybe it was the 23rd. 23rd or 25th, uh, they're going to add the amendment where um, DC, Washington DC, gets the same amount of uh, electoral votes, gets electors equal to smallest state. So there are several states that only have three, two senators and a house member, so they have three electoral votes, so DC gets that as well. So that gives us a grand total of um, 535 plus three is a 538 electoral votes for the presidency. And to get a majority, you need uh, 270 uh, needed to win. presidency. So in the odd case, and this happened a couple times in history, when there was no majority winner, when there were, you know, how many electoral votes uh, and nobody got 270, let's say there was three people or, or whatever, uh, three different candidates that ran, uh, and they uh, all combined for, um, and this was earlier, so there weren't 538 uh, votes. This is in 1800, 1824. When there were multiple candidates and nobody got more than half of the votes, uh, in a situation where there's no majority winner, uh, then the vote goes to the House. So if no majority winner, oops, the House of Representatives uh, votes for the president to determine president. And the uh, idea is because they're closer to the people than the Senate actually is, uh, which is the whole point.
Uh, that's happened a couple times. That occurred in 1800 with uh, the two primary candidates were Jefferson uh, and John Adams, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. Happened uh, as well in 1824 with, I think it was a four-way split, but they had to reduce it to three for the House of Representatives voting. It was Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, um, and Henry Clay, and who the hell's the other guy? William Crawford? I can't remember his first name was William, but I lost him with Crawford. Uh, and they did reduce it to three, so they took Clay out. It was uh, Crawford, uh, John Quincy Adams, and Andrew Jackson that went to the House, and John Quincy Adams won. Um, in the uh, um, in the uh, corrupt bargain, as they called it, because Henry Clay allegedly agreed to get people to vote for John Quincy Adams, even though he wasn't he was less popular than Jackson, uh, to uh, uh, get preferences in uh, his uh, presidential seating um, in the executive branch. So, yes, that's the um, method by which the uh, president is elected if there is no majority. I'm trying to think. If there's anything else that I didn't mention that I wanted to. Oh, uh, not only do they just vote for the president, but they actually vote for the vice president too. Uh, initially it was just the vice president was the runner up, but uh, now you actually vote for a president and a vice president. Uh, so that's what's been going on for quite some time for both a president and separately a vice president. Uh, so when they count the electoral votes, you're, they're gonna count the winner for president and vice president, but what presidents do nowadays, they choose a running mate for vice president. So if you're gonna vote for the presidential candidate, uh, you're gonna also vote for the vice presidential candidate, almost certainly. Um, so that, that's how that works. Okay, and um, these electors are not members of the federal government. Uh, so as part of their, well, I'll just put it down for a second. Electors convene to vote in each in in home state, in home state. The reason why they do that is, first of all, back when they made this system in the 18th century, it was a, a pain to have to go from the further states all the way to the capital, um, especially for people that weren't even a part of the federal government, because as part of the requirement, they can't be a member of the uh, federal government if they're gonna be an elector. Um, so uh, it was a pain to, to actually go there, but also they didn't want people like uh, bullying or, or, that's not the right word, they didn't want people being intimidated to vote a certain way. They wanted them to make their own decisions where they felt more safe and they was less likely they would be sort of mob bullied or intimidated into voting for a particular candidate. So these electors uh, are gonna stay within their home states and they send those in a sealed envelope uh, to be counted actually by the uh, current vice president. So uh, after these electoral votes are all counted, uh, the vice president, the current vice president, so for example, uh, in the 26, uh, 2016 election between uh, Trump and Clinton, um, officially, Vice President Biden counted the actual electoral votes uh, in a joint session of Congress, which is actually held in the House of Representatives. So current Vice President uh, counts electoral votes uh, in a joint session of Congress. Uh, and that's gonna take place in the House, because it's a larger arena. All right, uh, that's pretty much the election process as far as the details go. Um, but that's the actual election when it's when everything's already been uh, filtered down uh, to or reduced down to uh, uh, the primary candidates. Um, so now let's talk about this lead up because it's not like anyone can just throw their name on this presidential ballot uh, and have a have a have an equally good chance of being elected. Uh, what happens is political parties submit a single, um, hopefully, a single candidate uh, whom they hope to be elected and represent their party. So let's talk about that process. So how we get to the Electoral College. So this is gonna be determined largely, so uh, how can I phrase this? The candidates in the electoral vote are uh, determined by uh, state policies uh, first, uh, and then the political parties. Because it's actually the duty of the states uh, to, and local governments to actually organize these elections. Uh, but the political parties are the ones that field the candidates and, and form you about them and, and, and uh, collect the data and uh, really just organize the actual uh, selection process so that they send their most popular candidate um, and put them on the ballot for the actual electoral uh, votes for presidency. So we'll, we'll, we'll break that down. The state one's actually pretty easy. Just know this, 
The actual elections, like the primary election, for example, uh, those are actually administered by the state and local governments. Um, and they are, that's pretty much their role in it. That's all we need to know anyway for the purposes of, of this class. Uh, we're going to focus on the political parties though, because first of all, uh, what is a political party? And we've mentioned this before, because we've been warned about this before, factionalism, um, uh, by as early as uh, James Madison in, in Federalist Paper 10. Um, you could definitely label these as a faction, a faction or a party, uh, with a, uh, a common set of political, or ideological actually, I could, you, should, you could say, goals. And their intent is to, uh, uh, for the purpose of um, affecting change, slash, I should say, affecting political change. Political change, uh, mostly through uh, elections. So that could include state legislatures or governor uh, elections. It could also include congressional elections, and it certainly includes the presidential election. Uh, so again, it's people that have a common set of uh, goals. They kind of view the world roughly the same. Uh, you know, given a set of issues, they uh, more or less agree how those issues should be handled, like pro-life or pro-choice or uh, pro-gun control, anti-gun control, whatever the issue is, uh, they have a particular stance. And even if not all people in the, the party agree with every exact item on the list, uh, they agree with most of them. So they're willing to sort of give up on a couple of the things to make sure that most of their ideas are pushed for uh, by the party. Uh, and again, we don't, <laughs> we don't particularly like this idea um, if you're a if you're a true Democratic uh, or true uh, Republican, I don't mean the party, by the way, I mean like an actual person who believes in Democratic uh, institutions and, and republics. Um, you don't like this idea because you'd rather have people voting based on their own conscience about what they feel is right, um, not sort of given a platform to agree to a certain set of things if they don't agree with it, just to pursue a political agenda. Uh, I know that puts a sour taste in my mouth, but Unless that's the way it is, um, and it's extremely effective. Um, you can't you can't knock them for that. Uh, it's very effective, and it's been effective since the beginning. Uh, having these uh, unified groups that believe these certain things, whatever it is, regarding the economy or society or prisons or abortion, whatever it might be, um, they uh, are much more powerful when they're when they're unified uh, under a particular candidate or set of candidates to to actually get representatives in Congress. Uh, get the, the presidential not, uh, uh, seat, uh, and then actually carry out their uh, initiatives and goals. So we got some uh, really early roots. I won't go. I won't spend too much time on this, but mostly political parties have been uh, in the United States dominated by what we call a two-party system. Uh, has dominated uh, U.S. history anyway. It's not the case in other places in the world, but certainly it is here. Um, and that means that while there are more than two parties, there really is, when you think about it practically, in Congress and for the president certainly, there's really only two political parties that actually are relevant uh, regarding you know, them actually getting stuff done, having the money, the resources, the popularity, the support, the, the media outlets, uh, the numbers in Congress, in state legislatures, in, as governors, as the president, whatever it might be. Uh, it's really been just kind of two throughout history. There have been moments where there weren't just two, uh, whether it was parties forming initially or splitting initially, but for a very long time, it's pretty much just been the two, uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. But if you look at them historically, they have had some very flip-flop, um, they have flip-flopped on quite a few issues. Um, like right now, for example, uh, Democrats herald themselves as the uh, party of uh, minority, uh, ethnic minorities and racial minorities, but I mean that wasn't the case. The 19th century was very much the opposite, at least partially, because uh, a good chunk of the Republican wing was uh, abolitionist, anti-slavery, and, and a good chunk of the Democratic wing was um, uh, pro-slavery uh, in the South. But that, that's, that's uh, um, well, I wouldn't say that's changed, because not only Republicans want slavery, but uh, Republicans were originally the party of minority rights, individual rights, and Democrats have sort of uh, either adopted or attempted to adopt that that banner uh, since the certainly since the 1960s, if not earlier in the 1930s, but certainly by the 1960s, 
with the new left movement. All right, so uh, the two-party system uh, has been dominant. Uh, there are minority parties. There are minority parties, absolutely. So some examples are uh, the Libertarian Party, the uh, Green Party, the Independent Party, the um, uh, back in the day, the Federalist Party, the Whigs, the National Republicans. There's all kinds of parties, and there's even way more than that. The Constitutional Party, there's a ridiculous amount. Uh, but throughout history, it's been, for the most part, true that really only two uh, have, at a given time are relevant. So there are minority parties, but they're largely irrelevant, um, and as well as uh, uh, minority party ideas that are unique. And again, when I say minority, I don't mean like racial minority. I mean like if Republicans and Democrats have most, like 95% of the people in the United States, minority parties are made up of that remaining 5%, meaning they're just, they're just very small. All right, so minority parties um, exist and they have their own ideals and ideas, but usually what happens is after a while they realize there's no point in trying to feel the candidates because it's just gonna go Democrat or Republican. So what they do is they try to mold their beliefs and merge with either the Democrats or the Republicans. So um, they, uh, over time, they tend to, they tend to uh, be absorbed by majority parties, uh, as well as their ideals and ideals adopted. So um, over time, like the Republicans and the Democrats, will see, oh, this minority parties a significant amount of people. Uh, so they end up adopting some of their ideals and then the minority party, uh, seeing that the Republicans or Democrats agree with enough of their ideals, they end up just registering uh, as Democrats or Republicans and being absorbed into the party. Uh, so that's kind of how it goes. Um, and this system's been alive and well for a long time. Um, we have uh, a series of, of five, and, and some people would argue there's six or seven potentially, uh, but we'll, we'll simplify and just keep it at five. There's been traditionally five-ish party systems uh, or two-party systems in the United States. The first one was like right out the gate, the first party system, the major two parties, and this is from roughly 1792 to 1824 or so. This was the, uh, the two parties were the Federalists. They generally were pro-Britain, they were pro-commerce, um, they were, what else were they? The, okay, they were in support of a central banking system. They were more about, um, um, well, they're just like the Federalists from the uh, uh, Federalist debates, anti-Federalist debates that we talked about. And a lot of anti-Federalists were the other party I'm going to mention here. Uh, and they were much more in favor of a strong national government. Um, but their opposing party at this point was the Democratic Republicans, uh, led by Thomas Jefferson and later uh, Madison and, and others. And uh, they were much more about smaller scale. I know I mentioned Madison in there. He does actually kind of which sides um, uh, after a series of Federalist scandals like the Alien Seditions Act, I don't wanna to get too US history on you, uh, but they were generally the opposite of uh, the Federalist views. They were much more about uh, smaller scale government, much more about rural uh, individual farmers. They were against a national bank like the, the first and second national bank or even what would nowadays be the Federal Reserve. Uh, that was the first party system. But this Federalist party's gonna collapse because they are uh, considered too elitist they weren't open to enough of the regular folk, uh, as well as their disasters with the um, Alien and Seditions Act, which were a blatant violation of, uh, of constitutional rights. Uh, so that party collapses relatively quickly. Uh, and from those ashes emerge um, the second party system that goes for about 30-ish years. Uh, and in this system, we have the Democrats, which sort of merge out of this Democrat-Republican uh, uh, party and uh, over, over different economic disagreements of, as industrialization sets in and some of these old economic um, issues sort of dissolve uh, and the Democrats uh, come out as a more protectionist based uh, uh, set of ideals and then you have what were the National Republicans and then sort of get adopted in the Whig Party uh, which is, um, the way they're more about uh, being um, protectionist. I'm actually flip-flopping this in my head. Nonetheless, uh, they have some varying views, but this party system also is going to be short-lived because both these only last about 30 years uh, and gives way to uh, the third party system, which is uh, largely what we see today as far as by name. Uh, and this is going to largely begin with the um, uh, Civil War and the sectionalist tensions between the South and the North. 
uh, for various reasons. Uh, Republicans sort of uh, uh, emerge and combine out of several smaller parties like the Know Nothings and the Northern Whigs and the Free Soilers and others in opposing slavery for various reasons, some of them moral, some of them immoral. Uh, and then the Democrats sort of absorb the Southern Whigs um, and, and, and keep some of their previous Democrats uh, and are much more um, states' rights oriented um, and uh, generally more so pro-slavery because uh, again they're seated there in the, in the Deep South uh, and that becomes the next party system versus Republicans and that's going to be the same set of parties uh, going forward but uh, the two more that I just want to briefly talk about here is the fourth party system where beliefs change again uh, in this system, this is where the, the Republicans really dominate. Um, from the, roughly the 1890s to about 1933, the Great Depression is what, what really hurts Republican um, popularity. Uh, what's going to be really popular here is Republican monetary policies um, uh, and uh, the progressive movement, which was a movement which believed in efficiency and protecting uh, the environment. Uh, they also believed in racial segregation, um, but Democrats definitely believed in that as well uh, at the time. They also are going to believe in uh, greater suffrage rights, so they increased uh, the, the suffrage for uh, men and then eventually women. Uh, they're also more focused on like eliminating uh, corruption in society and politics, so they're very anti-monopoly, antitrust. They're very anti-cronyism, so like all of, they're the ones, for example, that got the 17th Amendment to get rid of the state legislatures voting for senators. They wanted just people to vote for them. Um, they hated uh, monopolies and trusts. They had a lot of trust-busting legislation that uh, tried to keep economic competition. They're very laissez-faire, uh, but it's still gonna be Democrats versus Republicans. But uh, Republicans do dominate that era. And then uh, lastly, and again, people do argue there are more systems after this, but not the five-party system, the fifth-party system. And again, people do argue the 60s and even the 80s may represent a sixth and seventh party break even the 90s. Um, but we're, we're just gonna keep it simple with five. Uh, that emerged was uh, from 1933 to present. And it's the same parties, but slightly different views. Democrats versus Republicans. Uh, and that one, uh, again, it's gonna be a shift. The Democrats shift to being anti-laissez-faire, more interventionist economically, so they want a lot more uh, government involvement in the economy uh, to try to get them out of the Great Depression. So they uh, are more pro-union, so they get a lot of workers on their side, uh, and in turn, a lot of uh, blacks who are, uh, at the time, uh, in these urban scenarios, having migrated from the South um, during the Reconstruction, late 19th century and the early 20th century, and are working in these uh, urban settings. Um, they also begin to champion other rights eventually, especially in the 60s, uh, which sort of formed the modern set of ideals. And the Republicans became increasingly more uh, conservative and traditional, um, particularly after the 1970s and 80s, after the, the New Left and Civil Rights Movement and this more moral majority uh, movement in the 80s, especially under Reagan, uh, began uh, by then. So it actually went from Democrats being the conservative party and Republicans, the progressive one, uh, in these third and fourth party system to now, you've got a flip where the Democrats are consider themselves the more progressive one uh, and the Republicans consider them, themselves the more traditional conservative party. Nonetheless, those are the basic party systems and what's happened in all cases is um, these parties have worked within themselves to try to uh, garner support uh, and finances to get their candidate uh, out there uh, acknowledged and known by the public and voted for uh, in the presidency uh, as well as the, the uh, Congress, state legislatures, and governors too. So that's the role these political parties play. And um, they have uh, played a key role in actually getting their uh, candidates to the presidential election uh, and into the seat of the presidency. Uh, and they've done so through party conventions uh, and this is a trend that began in the 1830s uh, to now. Now, they've, they've changed form, but the, the idea here is they would send delegates and representatives from the party, uh, and they would sort of kind of have like a caucus where they would uh, get together inside of their own party and sort of uh, debate and pick uh, candidates that they wanted to run for the presidency, uh, or like I said, even in, in a state for governor or, or whatever. So uh, party conventions uh, from, from the 1830s to now they would be uh, party 
caucuses, which again is just an in-party meeting where you just decide who to support and and and, and uh, endorse in the elections. Caucuses uh, to uh, determine presidential candidate. Uh, and those have been popular ever since. Now they have changed form, uh, I, I do want to mention. And the reason why, well, before I get into the reason why, let me talk about what they're doing. So they want to obviously choose a, a candidate, but they also do want to do a few things. They want to set the rules for future years, uh, as well as their party platforms, so like what they believe in, what should or shouldn't be, uh, their issue that they, they want to uh, push uh, on when they become elected, if they become elected. Uh, that's what they're largely determining there. Um, <clears throat> these were popular and still are, but their forms changed, particularly uh, after the uh, progressive movement. So what defined a lot of these uh, movements, particularly in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, was uh, you would have what are called party bosses, which are essentially just influential people within the party that have a lot of money. Uh, and they were basically handpicking who they wanted to be candidate. Uh, and they would, of course, get those candidates into the, the spot, whether it's a mayor or a governor or a president, whatever. Uh, and then because they got them there, the uh, person that was in uh, uh, the position, whether it's a uh, legislature or a, uh, an executive position, like I said, mayor, governor, whatever, uh, they would sort of return the favor by giving these parties or companies or bosses, whoever they were, um, favorable contracts, tax breaks, all sorts of uh, uh, crooked uh, deals and issues like that. So party bar party parties, party bosses uh, uh, were dominated uh, party conventions and candidate selection. And in the late 18, uh, in the 1890s and the, in the early 20th century, we had um, a lot of very anti-big business political boss movements uh, with the populists and, 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 and uh, you know, rural, uh, both rural and urban, that were opposed to these rich folk uh, and big businesses sort of manipulating um, uh, politics. So uh, as a result, we have uh, what's called the progressive movement which I mentioned before, and you could say this goes roughly from the 1890s. It, it actually sees roots earlier than that, but we'll say 1890s to the 1910s at least. You could say it even extends beyond that, um, uh, but the 1920s is not as clear. Well, yeah, it's not as clear, but we'll say roughly then. Um, nah, we'll say 1920s, even though it's waning by that point. Um, this is where they were uh, intent on um, uh, uh, um, empowering regular people regular citizens. So not those people that are uh, wealthy uh, party bosses or wealthy business owners that can just sort of buy their way uh, into office or, or nominate who they want and then you know, return them, uh, re return the favor when they, be, when they took office. Um, this is a strong movement and what that's gonna do is it's gonna establish what uh, we're practicing widely now. Uh, they are going to uh, form the uh, uh, primary, presidential primary elections. were developed uh, to counter uh, party uh, bosses and big business. So what these are, uh, these are what we have now. Um, these are officially going to be adopted by almost all states. Uh, they, they still do have some party caucuses, but uh, these presidential primaries uh, were largely adopted by the Democrats by 1968 and the Republicans by uh, 1972. And these primaries are, if, you're, if you've been paying attention this last fall and winter, sorry, this uh, last uh, the, the spring and this previous winter of 2020, that's what's been going on, at least the Democratic Party, uh, because they don't have an incumbent president. So they've been trying to figure out who's going to be their candidate to go up against uh, Trump here in the, in the uh, fall um, uh, for the presidential election. Um, so they have to uh, determine of course, which candidate they believe will uh, have the best chance of doing so. So inside the Democratic Party, they have to figure out who is going to be their representative to put on the ballot uh, to go and, and face Trump in the fall. So presidential primaries are just that. This is where um, states and local governments uh, run uh, primary elections within a state to vote for party uh, uh, candidates. Um, so some of them are open 
to uh, uh, other parties or independents, uh, and some of them are, are closed uh, to uh, other parties or independents. So if the Democrats are hosting a closed primary, that means Democrats only register Democrats only. If they're having a semi-open or semi-closed, uh, it, it might mean that certain other parties or independents can join. Uh, and if it's open, it could potentially be anybody. Uh, most are closed or, or, or mostly. Most are closed or, or are um, uh, partially closed. Uh, just to ensure that like the enemy parties don't come in and just try to, to throw a wrench in uh, the election process and get a weak candidate out who will lose. Um, so these, uh, they hold these elections. And when you go uh, to these elections, again, states hold them uh, from January uh, till some point in the summer. It, it always varies whether it's July or August, but uh, you can assume that they're gonna take place from January uh, till July or August. And there's a reason for that, which we'll get to. Um, you actually go out and vote in your state, uh, in your district for the candidate that you like. Whether it's, you know, in this recent election, we had ones like um, uh, Joe Biden, who, who, who is ahead currently in the primaries. Um, we had uh, Bernie Sanders, we had Elizabeth Warren and others. Uh, there's a whole bunch. And as time goes on and as these elections go through, you kind of see who, which candidates are, are, are doing better, which have more support and are, are more likely to get the nomination. So. Um, when you're voting, you're not actually voting, though, for the candidate themselves. What you're doing is in your district, and again, this is determined by your, your state and local governments, uh, the, what the districts look like um, and how the voting takes place. You're actually voting for an elector or a delegate, just like the Electoral College. So again, if I vote for, if I'm a Democrat and I voted for Biden, for example, or Sanders, whoever I voted for, um, my vote's not going to count. but in the actual party selection, but it's going to count in my district because whichever candidate gets the most vote, votes in that district, uh, more than 15% and has a majority or the most, that whole district gets uh, kind of like a, an elector for the electoral college. They get a, a uh, what's called a pledged delegate uh, to go to these conventions, these party conventions. So when you're voting the primaries, uh, you're actually voting for a pledged delegate for the candidate of your choice. So it's just like a mini electoral college, I say just like, but it's very similar to a mini electoral college. So whoever, you all go vote for your candidate, if it's Democrats in this case in 2020, uh, and you cast your vote, and whoever got the most votes in that district, as so long as they have at least 15%, uh, they win. Uh, that district and they have what's called again a pledged delegate who goes to the party convention later in, in August uh, and they're going to vote for uh, their selection which whoever that was that one in your district so let's say this district uh, uh, Joe Biden won uh, by whatever percent so the elector or the the delegate from my district would go and they would um, pledge their vote uh, for Biden and they'd vote for him at the party convention uh, and that would um, when you count all those up across the whole nation, uh, as well as these other delegates we'll talk about here in a second, called super delegates for the Democrats, uh, they are going to decide who their Democratic Party nominee is for the presidential election to go up against Trump uh, on the ballot. All parties do this, even the smaller ones like Green Party, Independent Party, etc. cetera. Uh, Republicans normally do, but usually if they have a president, they just, unless they're choosing not to run for another term, they just, the president's gonna be their, their selection going forward. So in this case, uh, Trump is going to be going up for re-election, so there's not going to be uh, these primaries and, uh, 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 in the same way that the Democrats are carrying them out and other parties are. So that's what they are going to do. So these pledge delegates who you vote for in, in, in a primary, uh, whoever wins your, your local district or whatever, uh, they are going to go to the uh, presidential national convention. Presidential election, national... Convention. I had the presidential election, not a national convention, because I don't mean like a congressional uh, convention or something like that. These are all in party. In party. So you have, for example, a Democratic national convention where they're going to go here. I think it's scheduled for August, uh, and they're going to uh, decide who their candidate's gonna be that goes up against Trump. Uh, and like I mentioned before, it works the same way, except the only difference is since the primaries uh, and, and caucuses that have been implemented in the states since the progressive era, all the way up till the 19, 1968, 1972, and it became like 
the official process for the Democratic and Republican Party, uh, they go there and cast that vote uh, that their district decided. So again, if you vote in the in your district, uh, the 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 majority or the the most votes go to Biden. You're sending one person to that convention that's going to uh, vote for Biden for the uh, Democratic uh, nomination. So. Uh, at these national conventions, you have what are called pledged delegate, delegates. Uh, they have uh, pledged a vote for a candidate. And that, that candidate, of course, is, is whatever their district um, uh, voted for by, by uh, one with the most votes. But uh, they also include some unpledged delegates. Those are delegates that come to the convention not declaring who they're gonna vote for. Um, so for the Democrats, they have way more of these. They actually call them super delegates. Um, Unplushed delegates are generally people that are not voted for, that don't represent primary election districts. Uh, and in the Democratic Party, for example, uh, that can include uh, uh, prominent party leaders, former presidents, Uh, it can include congressmen or women. It can include uh, governors, uh, et cetera. These are what we call, again, super de delegates. Those are ones that are already uh, a major part of the Democratic Party or Republican Party, as well as a, a member of either party that are in Congress or as a governor or as president, former president, whatever it might be. They go to the party, uh, the national convention as well, and you uh, cast the pledged delegate votes and the unpledged delegate votes to see uh, who gets the nomination for the, um, uh, in this case, Democratic Party, uh, which is gonna be taking place uh, this summer. Um, and generally speaking, when there is a standout winner, um, the other candidates will say, all right, we're not going to win, so those who are supporting me, please support uh, this person instead. Uh, so, for example, Bernie Sanders did that in 2016 uh, when he had uh, lost the, uh, the uh, national convention vote to Clinton. He's like, all right, guys, thanks for your support, but please support Hillary uh, against the Republicans. In this case, it was against Trump. Uh, and that's what's going to happen in the National Convention as well. So say, for example, to get there, uh, if he already has it, I haven't been paying attention. Uh, but Sanders, who's clearly the, the, the clear number two, uh, is going to, or maybe even already has, said, all right, guys, thanks for your support, but uh, go ahead and support Biden now. Actually, I think that already did happen. Uh, regardless, uh, that's, that's how it, it works. And they are, of course, are going to uh, vote for and select their candidates. So that's their role. Uh, when they first get there, they have a couple other things to do. First of all, they have to, uh, uh, they're responsible for uh, confirming the credentials of the uh, um, candidates. That really means they make sure they qualify for the office of presidency. So, you know, they are 35 years old, they have natural born citizen, they've been here for 14 years, they have experience, all that stuff. They're going to verify the credentials. They also are going to vote for um, uh, the rules and procedures for the next convention or, or administrators. They're also going to uh, determine the party platform. And that means the uh, ideals they stand for. Uh, that's usually just a bunch of, um, I don't wanna say show voting, but that's them just trying to get in party support. Most of these uh, measures that they discuss uh, are very, very, very polarized. They're like very radical. Uh, or they're more radical in nature. So if you go to the Republican Party, they're gonna be a little bit more right-wing than they would normally if they're dealing with regular people because you gotta be more moderate. Uh, if you go to the Democrat, they'll be a little more far left-wing because again, it's all Democrats there and they want to get more of those fringe votes going towards them. And then when they go into the actual political world and that's pretty much impossible, they have to be a lot more moderate because of course there are moderates out there in Congress and state legislatures and all that. Uh, and, and as well as people on the other party that you have to get uh, on your on your side to make stuff happen. Uh, and then of course they, they officially nominate the uh, candidate. Most of the time when we get to the national convention, they already um, know who's going to win. It's not usually contested, uh, but that can happen. So uh, we'll, we'll say this, most conventions are uh, already known as far as the result. However, you can have a contested convention. 
which means uh, it's between, it's unclear between two who's gonna win. Uh, or very, very, very rare, you have a brokered convention when there's not even a standout two, like it could be any one of three, four, five people. Um, uh, it's uh, unclear between three or more. Uh, most conventions, though, we already know who's going to be the candidate for that particular party. Um, so that is how that one works. Uh, if you're wondering, like I did uh, years ago when I was in high school, who the hell pays for these things, um, the parties are actually extremely rich, guys. Um, the uh, parties are uh, dependent on donors, on donors. Uh, and these are political uh, donors, so that can mean corporations, trusts, I think even the UC system, I'm not sure how this works, but the UC system actually funds a lot of the presidential, or the, the Democratic Party. You can have private donors, etc. So they have their own party system that takes in this money and uses it to pay for the convention and, uh, and, and advertising and all these things uh, that, that, that they rely on. So too, by the way, do the candidates, though. And this is actually a bit more contentious. Um, candidates, when they're running in the primaries or, or uh, after this national convention, when, they, when they've chosen somebody, and then at that point it's like, all right, here's the Republican candidate, here's the Democratic candidate. Uh, they actually require billions of dollars. It's kind of ridiculous. Uh, to try to advertise, to make people aware of who they are, what they stand for, and why the other candidates suck, and all that stuff. Uh, so it's actually become kind of ridiculous. Uh, they spend billions on uh, uh, campaigning uh, and uh, political advertisements. So they'll go on their tour, uh, different states, and do their speeches. Um, they'll uh, pay for advertisements. Um, uh, and endorsements throughout uh, the media. Uh, it's an incredibly expensive process. So I will say this, um, the uh, uh, campaigns and advertisements uh, are, are like a year round thing at least now uh, by 2020 in the, in the 21st century um, are uh, increasingly important in the uh, primaries, those are very, uh, those get a lot of attention uh, and a lot of money spent on them because these candidates go around to the very states as they're holding them because yeah, there's a schedule. Um, so they'll go to, to Iowa and all these other states that are part of the first round of uh, primaries and they'll go and give speeches and represent people there and, and, and all that. That costs quite a bit of money to run campaigns in those areas, pay for advertisements. Uh, so those primaries are very, very uh, costly and, and important now. Particularly if you win the first few, or you do well in the first few, uh, then you get momentum. The other the other candidates sort of become less popular, and uh, it becomes a, a major issue. So these primaries uh, have become very important lately, and very expensive. Um, but that also extends beyond the primaries to uh, and uh, the uh, and after the convention. Uh, but that can continue too. Well, the primaries don't technically end of the convention anyway. So uh, in fact, sometimes they go into or beyond that. Uh, and at the National Convention. So here you'll see um, a lot of debates in the primaries between candidates as they try to uh, gain more momentum and favor from the public. Debates during primaries. And once they have their nominees for each party, uh, it's uh, quite common for there to be presidential debates between parties. So for example, after the National Convention, uh, when uh, they select their Democratic candidate. Uh, uh, so we'll say for now, it's gonna be Biden. Biden might engage in a presidential debate with uh, President Trump uh, from the Republican Party or maybe another party, um, although these minority parties aren't really relevant, uh, but they could have a, a debate then. Uh, and that can potentially shift public opinion uh, for people that are kind of moderate, sit in the fence on who they wanna support. Um, so uh, one way that they try to find out how people are feeling, uh, during and before, uh, before, during, and after these primaries and during the presidential uh, election after the national conventions, uh, political polling becomes a very popular mechanism for determining how people feel. Uh, plays a critical role in uh, uh, determining public sentiment. 
candidates, how they feel about particular candidates, uh, who they think won the debate, who they're favoring uh, in the upcoming election, um, uh, how, how after some primary defeats or wins, people are feeling about certain candidates. Uh, those polls are quite important. So they'll, they'll, they'll do those by sending them out by mail or offering them digitally, uh, and then they'll, they'll survey their campaigns, which of course are, are well-funded, whether it's the actual political party itself or it's the uh, campaigns, the individual candidates. Um, they'll use that money to send out these surveys, these questionnaires, and you'll, people will answer them and they'll, they'll kind of gauge how people feel about each candidate, who won the debate, whatever it might be. Uh, and those can have an impact, especially in the primaries, on um, who's going to make it uh, to this national convention, or when it's beyond that, who may or may not win the actual presidential uh, election. So, the last thing I want to say, I think, is this advertising thing has become a major issue as of late. Uh, and I think perhaps you can see why. It is, in and of, in of itself, very much vulnerable to um, uh, uh, cronyism, right? Where you're paying for somebody's campaign uh, or paying them and then they return the favor when they get into office by giving you talk tax breaks or government federal leases, whatever it might be. Um, so that's gonna be an issue. Oh, before I mention that, uh, what's become very popular nowadays in advertising is it used to be all about print, like newspapers, magazines, and pamphlets and things like that. But especially since 2000, uh, even earlier with, with TV and broadcast news, it's shifted. So these uh, advertising campaigns, campaigns have gone from uh, evolved, I, I could, you could say, evolved and moved away from print media, like newspapers, pamphlets, etc., uh, to modern media, uh, modern media. So obviously nowadays everybody's got their phone on them all the time, uh, inter internet access all the time here in the United States. So the popular venues are uh, anything that a smartphone can access. Uh, so that can include, it can include, although it's decreasingly including broadcast news, especially as um, uh, more of the older generation becomes less involved or, or in, in politics or, or passes. Broadcast news, all this is uh, on the decline. So that's, you know, CNN, Fox, and MSNBC, like those news, uh, those news uh, stations and things like that, that, that try to be relevant nowadays, but they're increasingly less relevant. Um, social media campaigns, uh, are incredibly popular and expensive. So they'll pay for political ads. Um, they'll uh, get on this. I think, I think Obama really started this one with Facebook and his advertisements and his presence there. Uh, uh, Trump, for better or for worse, has really popularized uh, Twitter uh, and other forms of social media for, for, for communicating with the public and um, um, doing their political campaigning. Uh, but they also uh, are increasingly accessing streaming services and, and media. Uh, like YouTube and, and others, they'll pay for advertisements to be inserted into there. So those are the, the, the popular, uh, the big money dumps nowadays for campaigning. But the last point that I want to talk about regarding all this campaigning, because it's been a major issue, and it still is, um, is campaign funding. So it is illegal, and it has been for a very long time, to bribe political officials. Right, that's, that's, a, that's a very much, a, it's certainly an impeachable offense, uh, but it can be a criminal or civil uh, offense as well. So um, political bribery is absolutely outlawed. Duh. Uh, but what people were doing was, and this is what, how cronyism worked, uh, they would uh, donate to somebody's campaign or to a candidate, and then the candidate, of course, would become go into office, and they would do uh, uh, perform uh, or grant favors to uh, that business entity, whether it's an individual or a company or whatever it might be. Um, political bribery is illegal, so when they tried to limit it, uh, the Supreme Court actually shot it down. So the Supreme Court uh, of the United States, SCOTUS, um, actually uh, upheld political campaign donations uh, in uh, 1976 and again in 2011 with varying details, wouldn't even know those, um, uh, citing uh, free speech uh, and uh, using money as an expression of your free speech, using funds slash money as an 
expression of uh, speech, or certainly liberty at the very least. So it's legal to do, but there are some uh, stipulations. First of all, you cannot donate to a candidate like them themselves their personal accounts. Uh, it's limited to uh, their, their campaign funding, which is a separate thing, and they have to record that, uh, and, it, and it's monitored. So like if I want to donate to... Um, uh, uh, upcoming, if I want to donate to uh, Trump's campaign or to Biden's campaign, um, I can't just give them money uh, or, or Venmo them money. Uh, I'd have to send it to their campaign. That would go to their campaign manager, and that is a totally separate account and fund, and they have to track how they use that money uh, publicly. So not only do they have to track who their donors are, but they have to track how they use that money because they can't use it for personal expenses. They can only use it for uh, campaign uh, purposes. Now, people have used that as an opportunity to abuse it and hire family members and friends and uh, send them off to do things and buy things and use things that are not directly related to the campaign. Like, I mean, if you're campaigning for somebody, you definitely don't need them to eat like a five-star dinner every night um, uh, for your whole staff, but they might do that. Uh, I'm exaggerating, but, but that, that's kind of the issue. Uh, so they can't uh, donate to campaigns, but they still found a way, found ways to personally benefit uh, campaign slash family members with that money. Um, another issue has been, what was I gonna mention? Oh, lobbying still absolutely exists. This definitely allows what we call lobbying, which you could see as a form of, uh, um, or should say enables, enables lobbying in, uh, in government. Lobbying is essentially crony capitalism in a way. So let, let's say, for example, I'm, um, I'm a Democrat and I'm pro-choice. Uh, I might get funding from a pro-choice organization, uh, Planned Parenthood or whatever. They might donate to my campaign, maybe millions of dollars, right? Um, so, so long as I uh, am pro-choice when I get into office and do things that are pro-choice, whether it's suggesting or voting on legislation that is pro-choice or shooting down ones that are pro-life, um, I'll continue to get funding from them. But as soon as I stop doing that, guess who's going to cut the funding? That's right, uh, my source for, for, for pro-choice, whether it's Planned Parenthood, whoever it might be. Um, uh, they're going to cut my funding. So when I'm lobbied, when, when people are funding my campaigns, I'm kind of obligated to do things that benefit them or that cause. And if I stop, uh, I am... Uh, I am endangering myself and my funding in the future uh, by not making that group happy. So that, that definitely enables lobbying, and that can be uh, any form of organization. That can be uh, corporations, or other small businesses. Corporations in themselves aren't the problem necessarily. Uh, businesses, trusts, individuals, parties, I mean political parties. Uh, Etc. All of those can fund my campaign, but I kind of have to toe the line for them and do things that benefit them, uh, or I'll lose that funding, uh, uh, and that that pressures me to do so. So it's kind of that you know, help me in the office and I'll help you out sort of thing uh, going on, and and it exists. And again, they aren't supposed to directly benefit, um, but uh, nonetheless, they're dependent on that money because it's millions, if not billions, of dollars, depending on on who you are and what you're running for, uh, and they don't have that themselves for the most part. Uh, and they're going to have to, like I said, sort of cater to what their donors want, uh, which is a form of lobbying, uh, which is a very toxic development here uh, in the United States. Not just the United States, but certainly in the United States. There's a lot of things that we can't get done or get blocked or get hindered uh, because of lobbying. Uh, and you can point fingers at uh, different political parties and groups for that on, on different occasions, but uh, it's definitely uh, an issue. So that is an overview of the process for electing the president, uh, the role and uh, procedure of the Electoral College and why, the primaries and their relevance and how they, they came to be, uh, the uh, role of political parties and their origins, uh, the, uh, the, the conventions and caucuses and the national convention for determining the president, as well as the actual uh, contemporary campaigns with social media, the billions they spend, the polling, uh, and the um, uh, issues and limits we have on campaign funding. So uh, next week we'll be talking about the judicial branch, but that is it for the executive branch. Mm -hmm.